The information and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of ASRM and its affiliates. These podcasts are provided as a source of general information and are not a substitute for consultation with a physician. Welcome to ASRM Today, a podcast that takes a deeper dive into the current topics in reproductive medicine. ASRM is publishing an update on testing and interpreting measures of ovarian reserve, and we talk about it on the show today. So right now, most people are using anti hormone, which is a hormone value or a blood test um, that can be drawn any time during the menstrual cycle. The other option is to um, measure the antral ovarian reserve using an antral follicle count. Um, and this in, requires doing a transvaginal ultrasound, usually during the earlier follicular phase during on um, cycle days two, three, or four, and measuring the number of follicles between the two to nine millimeters in size or, or less than 10 millimeters is usually what we define as the antral follicle count as seen on ultrasound. I am Jeffrey Hayes. Today on the show, I speak with Dr. Ann Steiner, Professor-in-Chief, Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Duke University. I brought Dr. Steiner on the show to talk about the ovarian reserve update. I opened our conversation asking about a quick clarified definition of ovarian reserve. Ovarian reserve is defined as the number of oocytes remaining in the ovary or the oocyte quantity or oocyte number. That's usually how we define ovarian reserve. Are there certain measures associated with that? Yeah, so um, obviously we can't measure the number of eggs remaining or oocytes remaining in an ovary. Um, By doing so, we would have to remove the ovary and destroy the whole purpose um, of trying to determine the ovarian reserve. Um, So we look at biological markers, and we can separate these into hormonal versus um, more what we kind of uh, physiologic, so um, ultrasound markers is usually what we use. From hormonal, we talk about classically anti-mullerian hormone or inhibin B, and then which are granulosa cell products, or we talk about uh, uh, early follicular phase hormones uh, such as day three FSH and estradiol. From an ultrasound measure, we use both antral follicle count and uh, ovarian um, overall ovarian size or volume. So you mentioned ultrasound markers. Is that a type of ovarian test? If not, what type of ovarian tests are currently being used? So right now, most people are using anti hormone, which is a hormone value or a blood test um, that can be drawn any time during the menstrual cycle. The other option is to um, measure the antral ovarian reserve using an antral follicle count. Um, and this in, requires doing a transvaginal ultrasound, usually during the earlier follicular phase during on cycle days two, three, or four, and measuring the number of follicles between the two to nine millimeters in size or, or less than 10 millimeters is usually what we define as the antral follicle count as seen on ultrasound. Is there anything from the document that you think patients, what else should patients know? Well, I think patients, what and patients really need to know about this is these are uh, surrogate markers of um, the number of remaining oocytes. Uh, so what they don't tell us is about the quality of the oocytes. It really tells us more about the number of eggs remaining. And clearly, we know that a woman's number of women's eggs declines over time, such that you know. Or, when she's born, she um, has this large number of eggs, um, but then eventually over time, she'll continue to lose eggs. And then at age, when she goes through menopause, she has very few eggs remaining. Um, So what we're doing with ovarian reserve testing is just trying to get a measure of how many eggs there are remaining. And we can actually compare, we have some, you know, norms based on a woman's age as to what we would expect to see regarding ovarian reserve at any um, age in a woman's lifespan. I want to take this opportunity to sort of shift the conversation then. We've been talking a lot about 
the more patient-friendly aspects mm -hmm. of this document and in defining ovarian reserve and the type of tests and markers. Mm -hmm. Shifting now to, to more of the physician side of things, mm -hmm. what would you recommend using for physicians? You know, which, which patients should undergo uh, uh, the testing? So the first thing is kind of which hormone markers to use. I think most people, when this, the kind of the change in this document now is that previously when the document was released, most people were using day three FSH and estradiol. And then some even insurance companies were requiring people to uh, do some dynamic testing with their patients in the form of the clomiphene uh, citrate challenge test, which requires a whole cycle um, for a woman to um, complete, um, to complete just this assessment of ovarian reserve. Uh, right now, more people have moved to using antral follicle, antral follicle count or antimullerian hormone uh, to really replace these. One, because it's a much more sensitive test, and two, at least with AMH, it can be drawn at any time in the menstrual cycle. So I think the, the important thing for the clinician is they need to know um, that we've really moved away, um, and for insurance companies too, it'd be great for them to know, that really we're moving away from this day three FSH and clomiphene citrate challenge test to the more sensitive anti-mullerian hormone or antral follicle, hormone, uh, antral follicle count. And uh, regarding uh, who should be tested, I think we can start moving into that Let's, let's kind of walk that through. I think because it depends, you're right, there are various scenarios um, where one should consider and probably not consider doing these tests. And we can certainly delve into that further. So it's been a, a, a number of years since the last time there's been new data or that the, the, there's been an update. Mm -hmm. What has happened to yeah. cause this update? Is, is there been uh, new literature? What type of new data has been presented to facilitate this update? Yeah. One of the major points and the major reasons that we need an update is one, um, development of the markers themselves. Obviously, now moving to using anti-mullerian hormone or antral follicle count really as a norm. The other reason is that we have a better understanding of the value of these tests. We've investigated their clinical utility in a number of different scenarios, whereas really Previously, we had really only focused on their value in predicting outcomes following assisted reproductive technology, so following in vitro fertilization. So really now we have a better understanding of, one, how well these tests predict fertility in women with unproven reproductive potential. So we know more about ovarian reserve as a fertility test. We also have a better understanding of um, how these markers can be used to predict response to ovarian stimulation, and as well as we have even more data on whether or not in the value of these clinical tests in the setting of assisted reproductive technology. So this is really what this document goes into, is highlighting or reviewing the literature that's out there in these various scenarios. I want to thank you for being able to take time to do this today. And my final question for you is, what's your take-home points that people should be aware of in reviewing this particular document? Well, I want to focus on the major findings that we did, um, that we did highlight and the value of these uh, clinical, of these uh, ovarian reserve tests. Number one, uh, the data is pretty conclusive um, after numerous, a number of studies have been published uh, showing that really these ovarian reserve tests should not be used as fertility tests in women of unproven reproductive potential. In other words, they really cannot be used independently of a woman's age to predict her likelihood of conceiving naturally. In women that don't have infertility, we really don't recommend using these tests. So I think that's for both patients and providers should know that if they're looking for some test of a woman's fertility, this is not the one for them. That doesn't mean that there's not value behind these ovarian reserve testing um, markers. Specifically, we do continue to find that anti-mullerian hormone and antral follicle count are good predictors of response 
to controlled ovarian hyperstimulation or could, uh, such that women are uh, with higher AMH values and higher level or lower, more antral follicle counts can expect to have more oocytes retrieved following controlled ovarian hyperstimulation for in vitro fertilization. So that's the great news regarding the value of these tests. Whether or not ultimately these predictors actually predict live birth following in vitro fertilization or other assisted reproductive technology, that's still out there and, and needs to be refined further. But right now we have largely recommended that they more be used as predictors of response to ovarian stimulation. So I think the main take-home points were, which we want to for people to take out of this is number one, really that we're moving to antral follicle count and the anti-mullerian hormone as the most sensitive and reliable markers of ovarian reserve. They should not be used to predict the likelihood of conceiving spontaneously or naturally in women without infertility or even in women with infertility. And they do appear to predict response to ovarian stimulation, but it doesn't necessarily uh, seems to be a deal breaker regarding live birth rates or ultimate outcomes following in vitro fertilization. And we really want to stress that all these markers are markers of ovarian reserve. They are not markers of oocyte quality, and they should not be used in any form or cannot, should not be conveyed to women as a marker of oocyte quality. We've been talking today about the newest ASRM update on ovarian reserve and ovarian reserve testing. Our audience, please go to www.asrm.org to check this document out and everything else that we currently have published up on the website. Dr. Steiner, thank you so much for being able to be with us today. My pleasure. My pleasure. That was Dr. Ann Steiner, Professor in Chief, Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Duke University. I'm Jeffrey Hayes, and this is ASRM Today. This concludes this episode of ASRM Today. For show notes, other information, and discussions, go to asrmtoday.org. This material is copyrighted by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and may not be reproduced or used without express consent from ASRM. 